So we have a storm, a big storm. We're supposed to talk really loud so that you can hear us. I don't think anyone's going to leave this tent, which is really good for us. <laughs> um, but anyway, it's perfect because there is a major disruptive storm happening in retail. I think that this is probably the most disruptive time in retail, maybe since Sam Walton hung his first shingle. And I'm sure my panelists would agree. We have a great panel here of some fascinating disruptors. Uh, we have Lisa Falzone, who's the founder of Revel Systems, which is an iPad-based point-of-sale system used in retail and restaurant chains. Uh, and she's got some big partnerships with some very high-profile companies. Apoorva Mehta, on the end there, is founder of Instacart, the three-year-old online grocery delivery platform. He was an engineer at Amazon before founding Instacart. There's a trend here. And Mark Lohr is, uh, this is a really exciting time for Mark because he's just seven, eight days away from launching Jet.com, which is his ambitious new startup um, that's really aiming to bring the membership model, the wholesale club, the price club model online. He, you're asking people to pay $50 for something brand new that they may already be members in some, uh, some of these clubs already. Um, that's a, could be a risk. Some might say that's risky. Yeah, I think our value proposition is very compelling. So it's $50 a year, and the idea is that you would save hundreds of dollars relative to the lowest prices you'll find online. That's Walmart, Amazon, whoever the lowest price provider is. So we give them a six-month membership. We prove that you save more than $50 in a six-month period, and I think it'll be a no-brainer to sign up after that. It's very different than other memberships that are out there today that are focused more on um, speed of delivery and, uh, and other things. It's true. I mean, uh, Apoorva, same-day delivery, you might take issue with uh, Mark's position that, you know, the speed is not, is not as important as the price. But um, you started Instacart a couple years ago. Is everyone familiar with Instacart? I think everyone is now. It's online grocery delivery. I'll ask you a question I know you've gotten before. I know Mark Andreessen has asked you this question and many others. The online grocery uh, space is one that is really haunted with ghosts rattling around from the first uh, dot-com bust. Uh, Webvan, Peapod, Cosmo. Uh, how are things different this time? Um, so look, um, 10 years ago, or whenever Webvan was started, the demand had always been there, right? And it's still there. People did not want to go uh, grocery shopping and lug all their groceries back to their homes then, and that's the case today. But what has changed today and, and why this is the first time in history where a company like Instacart is actually possible is because smartphone penetration. There hasn't been a time where smartphones um, it, are, are so prevalent that everyone has them. And, and as a result of that, we're able to, to utilize the, the people who have them to pick and deliver the groceries. So when you want to order groceries, we connect you with someone who can pick those groceries and deliver them to your door. So this is the same reason why Uber and Lyft exist today when they couldn't have existed 10 years ago. So you know, we, we think, uh, you know, in our opinion, uh, it's actually price selection and convenience. All three of those are important. It's not just one thing. And with Instacart, I think that customers can get all three of those. You um, pivoted from your first uh, early days model, which was Instacart doing all the shopping and doing all the delivering uh, and capturing all the profit, marking up the goods capturing that, that margin. Then you shifted to it to partnering, actually, officially partnering with the retailers. Uh, talk to us a little bit about why you made that shift and when you saw that that was necessary and why. So you know, in the early days of Instacart, you would, it was a two-party marketplace where, uh, as a customer, we would connect you with a personal shopper who would pick and deliver the groceries. That started to take off, and we were doing so much volume from the stores that that we were hitting the threshold of how much we can deliver from the stores. So when we, the reason for the partnerships initially was to just drive efficiencies so we could get more volume from the stores to the customers. And when we started talking to them, we realized that there were more and more ways to partner with them. Today, Instacart builds enterprise software for the retailers so that they can use analytics from the, from, uh, the Instacart platform to better merchandise, better, uh, uh, to better find out of stocks on, in their own shelves. And, and so we, we see that Instacart is becoming more and more the, the retailer's best friend. And I think that that's what's changed. 
Were they resistant at the beginning? How did you convince them to partner with you? I mean, are we talking, is this incremental business for them or is this replacing an in-store visit? So, uh, you know, we thought that they were, um, that this was, you know, this was going to be relatively hard uh, initially. And what we found was that, um, that retailers were seeing between 40 to 82% of the customers that were coming through Instacart were new customers. That they would have gone to a corner store nearby, they would have gone to an online only player like Amazon Fresh, Peapod, Fresh Direct, or to, or, um, um, or to getting pizza delivered to their door. Right? So these were customers who did not have access to, to groceries, were now getting groceries through, through, through their stores. And so uh, that was a big sign, it was very clear. The second thing was our Instacart's average order sizes were two and a half to four times larger than, uh, than in-store order sizes. So it was very clear to the, to the retailers that this was a big win. And, and every single grocery store, one of the biggest questions that the cashiers get is, do you deliver? Now, not only do they deliver, they deliver within one hour. So do you think that they were thinking about starting this internally? I mean, this, this is such a disruptive, I mean, as you mentioned, all those other companies were already, already doing it. So putting the grocers in a, in a, in a position where they, they had to do something, were, they, were any of them considering doing this in-house? So, you know, I think, uh, I think it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to see this because, look, online-only players have been around for a while, like uh, for, for decades. Amazon Fresh has been around for a while, Peapod and Fresh Direct have been around for a while. Um, but uh, they have not expanded significantly. They, and, and in the markets that they cover, they're not really, uh, they don't really have high penetration. And so, so the, the, the reality is that there are two, two reasons for that. The first is that customers want a larger selection. Customers want to be able to order from their local stores. And this is especially true for if you are ordering from uh, Whole Foods, for example. The, the items that you can get there are not available anywhere else. So you want that. And the second thing is customers want the one hour, two hour, and same day delivery, right? So if you think about, uh, which is obviously not possible with the, you know, pea pods and uh, the Amazon freshers of, of the world. Yet. <laughs> uh, uh, well, no, it's, it's structurally impossible because if your warehouses are two hours away, you cannot deliver within one hour. Um, so one of the things that, that we, we have seen is that Building this requires the, the skill set of, of understanding machine learning, understanding, uh, uh, understanding how to, to, to build the, the apps within the, uh, for the shoppers to be able to pick and effectively navigate the stores. These are not the skills that grocery stores are good at. They're really good at merchandising and, and finding the right items to, to, to procure. Lisa, you are the representative on the panel for uh, brick and mortar, even though Porva obviously deals with brick and mortar retailers. Uh, you founded a company that does point of sale technology. Uh, how did you decide to start a point of sale company, which is a, which point of sale is a really, you know, it's been around for decades in retail. Uh, what led you to start a company in 2010? So it's kind of funny um, because we actually started the company through doing an online idea. So we started the company from doing online ordering, and we were trying to integrate into these legacy point of sale systems. But through integrating to Explain the Explain a little bit what point of sale does sure. to the average person, because it might not be something everyone's familiar with. So does everyone know what a cash register is? <laughs> <laughs> so, so we do, so we're basically a smart version of the cash register. So you know when you have, um, when you're at a bar and you're, and you see the, the server putting in orders, that's what we do. We do that on the iPad. So it's an iPad, card swipe, rec receipt printer, cash store, and stand. That's what we do. And that's, and so that's a transaction part of it. Um, there's a whole, there's a slew of software on, on the front end and different modules that, that's um, customized to, to your business. Um, and then the real power is in the back end. That's where you get the real business intelligence. So what, does, what, what did you bring to the table that was missing from all those legacy players? So le the, legacy, the legacy players haven't changed in 20, 30 years. They're still using back office servers. Nothing's hosted in the cloud. It's just completely archaic technology. If you look at cl purely cloud-based point of sale solutions, they're very, very slow. When the internet goes out, you're basically, you're basically dead and the restaurant or retail owner can't take transactions, which is a huge problem. Um, the iPad and the way we've designed our software is a perfect hybrid. So it's the speed of a local-based system, so it's really, really fast in the transaction side, um, and the benefits of a web-based system. So no more back office server, everything's hosted in the cloud. 
And um, you've got some big big partners as well. I mean, you uh, had an early partnership, or is this a recent partnership with Apple? Uh, with can you talk about that a little yeah, bit? Yeah, with Apple and then also Intuit. So um, Intuit took about 12 months, and they wanted to partner with the next gen the best next generation point of sale system in in the world. And um, they did about 12 months of due diligence, and they chose Revel. And so together with Intuit, we're creating QuickBooks point of sale powered by Revel systems. Um, and Apple did a similar a similar type of research, and so they chose Revel. You have uh, seen a, some very fast growth. You're going to be your 200 employees or some? 300 plus employees. 300 plus. Bring on um, about 30 employees a month. That's, that's fast growth. You are operating exclusively in brick and mortar retail. Or retail. Those are your customers. So um, brick and mortar is not going anywhere, I'm guessing you would say, despite all this online disruption? Well, brick and mortar is not going anywhere. And then also, it really to innovate in the online, you have to have a next generation point of sale system. So um, you look at you know what's going on with mobile payments. You look at what's going on with you know gift, loyalty. There's so much going on. But they have to integrate with these legacy point of sale systems. And they're just, they're just archaic. They just don't have a very flexible open, AP, open API. And so really, really to innovate um, and to in innovate in commerce of all these um, exciting things that are happening, um, you've got to have a next generation point of sale system that's open and that's flexible and that can integrate with these, um, with these online players. Uh, Mark, w what do you think about Lisa's system? <laughs> Yeah, it, so it sounds great. It definitely, uh, I think retailers in general, brick and mortar retailers, need to focus a little bit more on innovation if they're going to compete in this new world. So people are talking about omnichannel and and um, you know big big retailers like Walmart focusing on being everywhere so that you can order online, you can also go and pick it up at a warehouse if you want, uh, you can go into the store, you can order online and return in the store, all of this stuff. It, how big a deal do you think this is going forward? Yeah, I certainly think that that is the future of retail, but not being done the way it's currently being done. I think there are certain um, economic realities that, that these brick and mortar retailers need to face. Uh, one, for example, it's competing, an online brick and mortar retailer with an online presence competing against an online only retailer has both the price and speed advantage. They have a price advantage by offering in store pickup, but not pick from store, actually picking it at the same warehouse they do their internet orders, then driving it direct to the local brick and mortar shop and having consumers come and pick it up avoids last mile delivery. So that should be theoretically cheaper than an online only player. That's an advantage. They haven't leveraged that to date. I think you're gonna see more of that. And what that means is, and they haven't been reluctant to do that, is that the price of buying something online and picking up at your local store is going to be cheaper than going into that very same local store to buy the product. That's the game changer that we're, I think we're gonna see very soon. Why has no one done what you're doing yet? Why has no one brought the Price Club model online thus far? I think, well, a lot of what we've done we haven't really talked about is it's not just, it's not just a Price Club. We've built sort of a, a real-time, looks more like a trading system technology. Um, that basically reprices products in real time as a consumer shops to reflect the true economic cost of getting that product to you based on what's in your shopping cart. And so it really is a technology at the end of the day that's able to empower consumers to pull costs out of the system. So we're basically showing consumers, hey, you have these two things in your basket, now you're shopping for a third thing. Let's say you have a baseball bat and a ball in your basket and you search for a glove. The way it works today is the price of the glove is the same. All the search results, the price of the gloves are exactly the same regardless of what's in your basket. But the cost of getting that glove to you, the different gloves, vary dramatically based on what's in your basket because some gloves can be shipped together with a bat and ball in close proximity to you in the same box. Other gloves can't. And so we make those cost savings transparent to a consumer and we call these smart cart bonuses. And the idea is to steer consumers toward more economically efficient orders, which pulls costs out of the system. That's, that's been very difficult to build. Apoorva, um, you were saying backstage, you're working on a point of sale technology of your own. Is that right? Um, no, we're just uh, having a discussion. Oh, you were? OK, uh, sorry. I misheard you. <laughs> <laughs> I'd highly, I would not recommend it. <laughs> It's a lot harder than it looks. <laughs> um, oh, we're not, so. Okay. 
what are you working on? I mean, a, a, a while ago you had said that your goal is to uh, become the next Amazon.com, and you might get into different verticals. In other words, not just grocery. Is that still something you're you're thinking about, or are you going to focus on on this vertical first before doing anything else? So, look. Um, Groceries are um, a very strategic vertical. They allow us to um, get the economies of scale with the delivery. They allow us to make sure that the, the, the cost of doing each delivery goes down uh, over time. You can't do that with other verticals because the volume is just not there. Um, and so what we're doing is we're starting with groceries that has a tremendous amount of challenges. Uh, the, the way you pick shrimp, for example, is very different than the way you pick uh, avocados, and they're about you know, uh, about seven million items on the, on the Instacart platform. So training shoppers across the country to pick those items is very challenging. But once we have that and the economies of scale, we can go into other verticals and allow all of retail to come online and allow customers to be able to, to, to get that delivery within one hour of the same day. I want to talk a little bit about um, the technology and how it's evolved in terms of tracking uh, sh shoppers' behavior, the data that's available. I mean, Lisa, you know, r online retail tracking has been around since the cookie. Uh, but what's new and what's different and what are we able to learn now? What are you able to learn now that you weren't before? Right. I mean, definitely. it's It's been around. I mean, Amazon has had the data, um, had customer data. It's all about customer data and what they're purchasing, how many times they come back. Um, and you know, companies like Amazon, even I mean Walmart, um, big box retailers have had this for a long time. Um, but with you know the hybrid cloud-based point of sale systems, we're able to deliver that to these small and medium-sized uh, markets and make them and make them competitive. So it's it's pretty exciting. Mark, what about with Jet? How will you use data, or what what how will you use it to your advantage? I think just really understanding all the intricacies of the supply chain is what really allows us to pull costs out of the system. So we're partnering uh, with retailers that already have inventory that exists all over the U.S. And we're trying to optimize and trying to, rather than have the consumer pick the product they want to buy from the retailer they want to buy it, which is really inefficient, we're basically picking the retailer for the consumer at the basket level once we know what basket the consumer is interested in buying, which allows us to, to m better optimize the supply chain. And you've also made things a lot more transparent, both for the, the consumer, but also the merchant, right, I, from what I understand? So how important is that? Because you, you, don't have, you're, you don't have warehouses. You're working with other retailers, smaller retailers in many cases. So what does that offer them? Yeah, I think it's super empowering to, to retailers, and especially uh, the smaller ones, because they're able to set rules on Jet's back-end engine that allows them to compete where they have a uh, cost advantage. And in most cases, for small merchants, since there's a high cost of shipping, they compete really well in their local area. And so they can set rules that say they want to get really aggressive on price if the order comes in from a customer that lives within, let's say, 10 miles of their store. Um, so yeah, so I, I, think it, I think it will be um, really empowering for retailers. And that brings up another kind of rival rivalry that's not discussed often, which is the, the small mom and pop retailers or smaller retailers with the big guns. I mean, this is, you know, the, this is, they, they haven't had a way to scale or to, um, to compete. I mean, this offers them. Yeah, no, they haven't had a chance to compete yet because even when they sell on Marketplace and they have access to the traffic, which is hard for them to get, um, they're fighting for the buy box and there's a race to the bottom. And whoever has the buy box wins. And the small merchants can compete on average with the big players. But now we give them an opportunity to compete when the economics are in their favor so they can get more aggressive. Apoorva, one um, issue that, that Instacart has had to deal with that these guys won't is the, the issue of your employees. Are they, uh, you have um, drivers and shoppers and, and thousands of them uh, in your markets who are just like in Uber's case. Uh, contractors, and this is obviously becoming a very contested issue. There's court challenges to this. I think you've had some, Uber has had some. The courts haven't been so friendly lately. Um, how big of an issue is this, this recognizing, this push to recognize and make, you know, in the, in the sharing economy, make these contractors full-time employees, give them workman's comp and all those other kinds of benefits? Um, so look, this is an ongoing litigation, so <clears throat> I won't be able to comment too much into it, but you know, Recently, uh, at Instacart, we have 
begun converting uh, in-store shoppers, the people who are picking the groceries, into part-time employees. And this has already happened in a few cities. In fact, it happened today in a few more cities. So we're already doing that. And, and, and the reality that, you know, that we, we um, sort of found was that, that you know, picking groceries is very challenging. And it requires a lot of care um, that you just cannot expect from independent contractors.